understanding of how architecture operates. I, I think we, so much of our field is going powerfully medieval on us right now. And um, that's not a bad thing. I mean, I, I put a Gothic cathedral up against anything, anything. Right? You'd say, oh, it's an unfair fight. You know, they spent 500 years making that cathedral. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the game. Can I, one last question, and maybe we'll wrap it up. If I'm interested in this idea that you would, you wanted uh, to create an institute of failure, and maybe either to teach failure or to incorporate the notion of failure within a within a, uh, a pedagogical institution. But it seems to me both of the schools that you you, you preside over, um, you know, at the end of the year, we have end of year tables, and the student. Is mortally, you know, is mortally programmed mm. to pass and not to fail, and um, how, how uh, you know, and we celebrate the successful students. The successful students are the ones that get the prizes, the ones that get the magazine front covers, etc. Where, where is this evidence uh, of the instrumentalizing of 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 of, of, of the notion of failure as an epistemology, as a mm. pedagogy, in these, frankly. I would say, um, you know, quite, um, I mean, uh, successful schools mm. that are successful for producing successful alumni mm. um, and not successful for the ones that we've forgotten, let's yeah. say. So how do you, and that's what I'm interested in, this 20-year gap between the ideas that you had then and, and let's say what's at play, not only now, but it seems to me, at any, I mean, the idea that um, rumours would suddenly spread that either of your schools are suddenly from going the best from being the best schools in the world to the worst schools mm. in the world, I can't imagine would fill you with the with the, you know with the with the, yeah. with the with the greatest amount of, of, of joy, you know. So, how can you maybe say something about uh, how I that plays in? First of all, just firstly, before he even <laughs> what you just said has happened to both schools. Yeah. Recently, I mean, you know, it it it, it happened. There was a and moment, what do you do about it? There was a moment th three years into to, uh, to the BRL when we launched it because we built it around a series of, of online archives and we had ten or 12,000 images online in the first three years. of uh, We put up images of projects, the writing about the projects, and we uploaded all of the original files for people to take and use in whatever form they would want. And, and in about version 3.0, somebody came into the studio one day and showed us they had, they had gone home on the holiday and had come back and we had been banned in China we had been blocked from firewalls in China, and in effect made to disappear. Which I found, I mean, I never got to the bottom of it, and I don't understand, and it lasted for two or three years, but for whatever reason, schools there, and schools of architecture there, incredibly powerful political instruments, simply took it offline. And in effect, I think the technologies are in place, like the translation wars that are playing out today between Google and, and that country. The technologies are in place where that kind of thing isn't a hypothetical anymore, it's an everyday fact of our lives. I think my response to it would be, and I, think, I know this was one of our ambitions when we were first sketching out particularly curriculum ideas for the, for this, the seminars, was, was a kind of, and the, the argument I would make was that what architects need is, is simply many, many more words for failure, like, like snow for Eskimos. They live in such a world of failure, they need actually 50 categories of failure. I think. To fail at an end of your table um, is one form of failure, but to fail for, for not seeing the possibilities in a project or that you will let a next generation take it from you is a completely different form. And I think it is a matter of, of making a choice. One matters more than the other, but it's how to balance the, the possibilities in all of them that I think is, is interesting. I went to this school at a time in which we didn't, for example, present our portfolios at the end of your table. In fact, that was a feature up until about 1995. I received a letter in August of my fifth year that the project, the, the project was presented and passed, but with a note that I had failed my HTS because, by the way, you didn't write it. <laughs> and that's what took me nine <laughs> years, that, that piece. When we first met and I started working on, on, uh, on Mies and Lieberhaus, it was after meeting, Mies, uh, after <laughs> meeting Gordon Boonschaff's ex-chauffeur driver on Park Avenue who was driving a taxi in the late 80s in New York that I realized, and he, as we were driving by, he looked up at the building and he goes, you know, I know that building pretty well. And I said, what? And he explained the story of chauffeuring Boonshoff to the site for years. 
And only then did, did it seem like I suddenly had a project to write about back in relation to the project. And it took another six years. And in 95, when I came back, we submitted it. And, and I was able to get the diploma. But that happened to be a generation, by the way, in which most people didn't have a diploma from the AA. And uh, I went around the table once with a group of friends in the class of 86, which was my class, Mises 100th anniversary class. And, um, and I was the only person at the table at dinner in the late 90s to have a diploma from the AA because none of us wrote our history thesis because we were interested in other stuff. But um, it wasn't making a choice about which form of failure is better than another. It was just that, it's just that you picked some at a certain moment in your career and you worked with those forms of failure or success and then moved on to others later. I think right now it's all kind of collapsed down. I think this is something we have to negotiate with our ambition of relaunching the, the Institute, which, by the way, coincides with the 40th anniversary of Alvin's invention of the IID here in London, the International Institute of Design, which he labeled as a parody, really, on IIT to a certain degree. But, but I think a lot has happened in that 40-year period. Um, but mostly within architectural culture, failure has collapsed down to almost a kind of one-dimensional term. I think the challenge is to actually like like the language of, of, of part of what we're trying to do here tonight is to open that language up to a much more nuanced range of forms, let's say, and to celebrate and appreciate all of them. Okay, so quick three points. Yeah. Um, Enron's brochures uh, featured Frank Geary, and they repeatedly described his creative process as a model for their creative process. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, 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 true. it's a fact. It um, <laughs> Uh, point number two, uh, <laughs> um, I don't think that alumni are a good measure of a score. Um, you, you can play that game. So, for example, the right hand of Hunschaft in designing Lieberhaus was a student of Kiesler at Columbia during the war. Um, and she would not have been mm. there if it wasn't for the war and it wasn't for Kiesler. And Kiesler is the one who, who, who brought to Columbia the idea of design studios as a research laboratory which echoed the 1881, the, the way the school began as a research laboratory and so on. So, so yes, you can point to specific alums, but I think with the AA and with Columbia and so, some other schools, the, the, the question is more in the, in the, it's more to do with the overall sort of gene pool, not to do with successful alums. There are many schools that produce successful alums every minute, and no, not one idea has been associated with that school. I'm thinking of one in particular, but there are others. Uh, there are many. There are many unbelievably successful schools. In fact, if you make a hit list, if you name all the most top architects in the world and so on, only a small group will be coming from famous schools, and most will be coming from anonymous schools. So there's no, no, alums are just not a good measure of where the discipline is going. So somehow, nevertheless, of course, schools are made of students, so somehow, a school is made by students in the same way the lecture is made by the audience, but even more so. So something happens to the to the sort of potentials of a, of a field as a result of what goes on in the school. A publication of a school can be, and Elvin was a great example of that, can be powerfully more influential on the field than any one um, mm. uh, student. Although certain students, so for example Bernard Schumi, could become, you know, uh, 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 important, but important almost as a student teacher. I mean, that's the other. And point number three is, it's all a question of um, uh, this thing about the final review. You know, in Colombia, hardly anybody gets failed, but we did invent the category of low pass. And low pass is really like slithering, slithering in. I mean, really, nobody wants a low pass. People would rather be failed than receive a low pass. <laughs> and uh, people fight low passes and get forced to accept that they're an LP, you know. And... Um, but what is failure? So the question really is what would constitute failure if, as, as has been suggested, um, architects somehow accommodate uh, a brutality with their proposals, a really sort of endemic, never-ending, continuous violence to, to their proposals. And since they've chosen to be in that field, it, you choose to be in a field in which you would be subjected to this. So there's the whole, the whole masochism, you know, do you, do you have to be a masochist to decide to become an architect, or is it just sort of useful when you're there, or just, does it make you one? I, you know, these are all important questions. But if, but if the goal is, if the, if the real dream of the architect is not, 
is to produce something, as you, uh, uh, as you point out, uh, is to produce something that could have been even more, and to feel the desire, f to feel what was not done, then failure would be not, fa success is not making the building, right? And su success is not quite making the building. So then we need to, we need to, as it were, develop a system within the schools for in a way honoring the extent to which uh, a proposal, a drawing, an idea, or a sentence, and so on, even though according to a certain easy definition of success, fails, but nevertheless the, the feeling within that failure, it creates a sort of momentum to the next, you know, to actually be sensitive to what pulls the conversation uh, 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 forward. So if, if our real goal is to produce a kind of poignant, sort of bittersweet melancholy, then surely we could work on that. I mean, really work on that. And I think new kinds of archive and new kinds of uh, feedback are going to be very, very uh, 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 e essential to this. I, when, when I was, you know, one of the questions we have to, to, to really deal with is why people choose to become architects in the first place. Because it's clearly a catastrophic uh, 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 choice by any measure, right? I mean, if you if the measure is you get to make buildings and create things, well, statistically, you don't, right? Um, so, is is the sort of is the is the set of psychological problems that lead one to choose to go to an architecture school? So if we don't analyze them, I mean, how are we supposed to analyze? You know, how are we you know, th and so essentially, uh, what are we doing with our patients? Ourselves being, of course, in in you know, patients who are not allowed out. Of the asylum, so so so, how do you develop within within the within the asylum a kind of an awareness of a collective desire to sort of linger around what a project could be but is not, right? And I think that that that, that would that would sort of, as it were, set in motion. Uh, my Last comment. Well, I just I just want to add that in a way I'm surprised no one's remarked on it. But at the AA, I mean, insofar as things are marked, there, there's actually no category of failure. The AA has always caused it, I mean, called it, and I don't know where it comes from, complete to pass. So in a sense, in a kind of AA way, you know, the Institute of Failure is really the Institute of Complete to Pass. <laughs> I mean, Bre Brett's kept on kind of saying that he managed to, you know, postpone passing, <laughs> uh, for a very long time. So really the, the question, you know, perhaps, I mean, while, in, yeah. while we've embraced it under the, the word failure, hmm. it's precisely, you know, the, the refusal of success yet, where the yet goes on and on and on. Yeah. Well, I, I, of course, lo love that. And, and it creates for me the image of the final, I've never seen this uh, s symbolic, satanic uh, ritual by which people to pass, but it sounds increasingly like border police who allow you to pass. So you hesitate at the threshold and you're basically allowed to leave the AA. So you have per permission to pass, to pass out of the building with no comment on your, on your presumed abilities afterwards, but you no longer have reasons to insist that they stay. Uh, and I think that, that, that following your model uh, takes success right out of the picture. And if success is out, then failure becomes something more subtle. And you, that's why you need an institute, because you've got to study it. <laughs> right? And that's our, so that's that's our final pitch. pitch. That, that would be the final pitch for this evening, everybody. Um, and just to remind you that, that uh, you all get the opportunity to join us in failing next summer together as a group, and we look forward to it. So thanks, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, everyone.